let's turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 1. Invite your attention to Hebrews, chapter 1. And uh, let's consider this morning uh, really what Pastor Scott and, and Ms. Georgia just sang about. Certainly, uh, life really would hang in the balance, if you will, if it weren't for Christ. And I want us to consider this morning, the, really the, the title of the message is The Weight of the World. I want to ask a question this morning, how much does the world weigh? I thought about that for a few minutes and discovered pretty quickly that I had no way of determining how much the world weighs. For some of us this morning, we probably would have to acknowledge that um, uh, the world might be pretty heavy for us today. The weight of the world is somewhat uh, relative to maybe our particular circumstances. For some of us, the, the world seems light when things are good, and other times the world seems heavy uh, whenever things are bad. Certainly it could be relative in the sense of what you determine is good or bad. Maybe it's relative in terms of what God says is good or bad. In any event, uh, the idea or the question of what the, wor the world weighs is probably a pretty relevant question for us this morning. And, and I want us to consider here from the book of Hebrews and chapter 1. I, I have verse 3 there on the screen. Let's pick it up uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and let's begin reading in the first verse. And we'll read through uh, that verse number 3. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past, Unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he hath or he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Boy, those three verses contain a mouthful. There's a lot of good doctrine in those first three verses. There's a lot of some history uh, in these three verses. There's certainly uh, some good applicable truths for our life today in terms of how much the world weighs. I was reading an article, again, as I began to pursue an answer to my question, how much does the world weigh? I was reading online, I read one particular article on a, on a, um, from a contributor to a, a, an article online called EHOW. Her, her name is Christy Flora, and I have no idea who Christy Flora is, uh, but I thought, well, that's pretty good information. We'll take that and run with it for this morning. Here's what Miss Christy says. Uh, she says, the weight of the earth cannot be determined by a use of a scale. Clearly, clearly we understand that. Therefore, it's more accurate to ask what the mass of the earth is. Weight is relative to gravitational field. Weight of an object on earth differs from its weight on the moon. Mass, then, of an object is constant regardless of its gravitational field, assuming, then, that weight of the earth is to be calculated in the earth's gravitational field. And here we go. You probably know this. Mass equals weight. So, in the year 2000, uh, some um, very smart people, uh, very smart people in terms of the scientists, some physicists determined uh, from the University of Washington that the Earth weighs 5.972 sextillion metric tons. I'll be honest with you, I don't even know what sextillion is. Does that come after billion or where does that fall in the line of billions, you know? 5.972 sextillion metric tons is how much the earth weighs. Well, then that begs another question. How did they figure that out? What kind of scale did they use? And in the article, it continues on and says this. The weight of the earth is calculated by using a torsion balance. A torsion balance is used uh, to record gravitational movement in objects. The first one was used to measure the weight of the earth in the 1800s. Advances to torsion balances over the years have increased the accuracy of the calculation of the weight 
of the earth. Therefore, here's some theories and or some speculations that are concluded or are in the article. Due to the advances in the sciences and the devices used, such as the torsion balance, and in scientific methods, scientists believe that there is less accuracy associated with the accepted weight of the earth in the late 1990s than there was even 10 years earlier. Advances such as have been made by the University of Washington physicists are more accurate than of an earlier calculations, which have the earth, listen to this, have the earth weighing at 5.978 sextillion metric tons. Guess what? We all have hope. The earth has lost weight. <laughs> Amen. That's encouraging for me. Praise the Lord. However, those advances raise questions that further advances in scientific methods and measuring devices such as the torsion balance are possible and probable. And I came back to the original question and conclusion. They don't know how much it weighs. They don't know how much the earth weighs. By the ever advancing mentality or, if you will, the education intellect of men to use things like the torsion balance. At first I thought that was a car park. These advances, the idea of giving them the capability of measuring how much the earth weighs. And in the end of time, here's the other conclusion I came to. My question, in the end of time, how much the earth weighs really doesn't matter. I wonder how much money has been spent on trying to figure that out. I wonder how many hours of education have been given, how many dollars for education have been given for the purpose of trying to understand how to use a torsion balance by which their own conclusion says that ever advancing scientific methods in the end will help us possibly become more accurate in our assessment of the weight of the earth when in, in, in the end they still don't know. Interesting question, when does the scientific advancement or the possibility of it being different, when does it ever stop? So in 10 years from now, we've advanced even further than the scientific idea. Well, the, the, the truth is there that we, maybe we can advance a little further. Maybe we can figure out how much the earth weighs. Now, here's my point I'm trying to get at. In the end, how much the earth weighs, ultimately there's one who does know. There's one who determined that long ago, Amen. There's one who understands every nth degree of the universe itself, and that is the one that created it. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I ask the question, how much does the world weigh, and or title the message, the weight of the world? Because often we can feel like the world is crashing down upon us. We can feel as if things are going so bad or in such a direction that are not good that we often feel the pressure and the weight that, that the world is bearing down upon us. And if we're not careful, we can lose sight of one important truth that God is the upholder of all creation. Did you capture verse 3 there in the middle of verse 3? Verse 3 has a lot of truth in it and certainly we would like to spend some time there. But we find in the middle of the verse, he says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the what? The word of his what? Do you understand the phrase, what, what that means? Do you understand, begin to wrap your mind around the idea that God is the upholder of all things. You know why the earth doesn't fl fly out of its orbit? Because God has it under control. You know why the sun doesn't burn us up? Because God created it. You know why the stars shine at night? You know why you breathe the way that you do? Do you understand where it says that God upholds all things, but then he says specifically by the word of his power. Boy, the weight of the world in the end, we come to one conclusion. The weight of the world is nothing to God. In terms of God and his perspective, there is no weight of the world. The word uphold is kind of where we focus our attention in that third verse, upholding all things. The word uphold literally means to, to carry. 
we might kind of use the idea of sustain things, but, but it's important that we get the right imagery from the language. The, the word upholding or sustaining things, they, listen, this is not the image of the word. It's not God trying to keep it upright. It's not God struggling with the idea of upholding things. By the way, God has your life well under control. Amen. God has the world well under control. Rather than seeing God as struggling to keep things in order, think of it like this. God is upholding, and the word literally means to carry. God is carrying all things according to the word of his power. The word carry is the appropriate understanding of the Greek language. And God said that he is upholding all things. By the way, there's a great imagery of that that in the book of John. In chapter 10 it says that I have put every man, it's a paraphrase, I put every man in my hand. No man shall pluck them out of my hand. Amen. The idea of our salvation is secure in God. You know why? Because God is the upholder of all things. God is upholding your salvation. By the way, praise the Lord that it's not under our control. Amen. If there's one pressure relief of the world that God gave us, it was eternal security. If there's one place where God said, let me take the weight of the world off your shoulders, it's the idea that now you're eternally secure. But but please understand, let's make sure we understand the idea of carrying it properly. God said, even though you're saved, you still need to honor me with your heart and your behavior. Is that right or no? Amen. Oh, we're not free then to do whatever. God said, we're carrying this thing along. You ought to want to serve me. You ought to want to love me. And because I have secured you and I'm upholding your salvation in the end, your heart is now free to freely choose to serve me and serve me well. Your heart is now free uh, to live for the Lord. God as the sustainer and the upholder of all things, therefore God feels no weight of the world. You know, I guess then in a truth, that's why it's so important for me to go to the Lord in prayer when I feel the weight of the world. Because I can go to him and where I feel the pressure, where I feel the weight of things upon me, God said, you just come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to me that feels no weight, and I'll give you what you need. I am the upholder of all things. And therefore we come to the truth that the weight of the world for God really is no weight whatsoever. There in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 we find several truths that I think are important about this idea of the weight of the world. And first of all let's remind ourselves that he is the upholder. And there's a reason why God is the upholder. And we have to recognize something here. We have to recognize that God is the upholder of all things because he is God. Amen. He is God. Back up to verse number 2 there. Look what it says. That he has spoken to us in these last days unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also, he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of of his person. One commentator said it like this, that when you laid eyes on Jesus Christ, you literally laid eyes on the very character and essence of who God is. Jesus Christ was not, as some would say, he was not just some person who walked this earth. He is God in heaven. Amen. And for you and I, that's an important truth. We, we kind of remind ourselves of that. But let's, let's also, t- in this context, let's consider he is the upholder of all things because he is God. It says there that he's the creator. He is the creator of all things. I'm amazed at science. I'm not a scientist, but I'm amazed by science. I'm amazed at how much God, how much capacity that God has given to men to look out into the universe. I'm amazed that men have the capacity of understanding to know how to go out into the universe and consider the creation of God. But let's remind ourselves, he is God by the power of his word. Amen. He spoke into existence all the worlds that be. They've determined recently that uh, Pluto is not a planet. I guess they've determined that Pluto is a Disney character. (laughs) Can I tell you this? God knows. God made it. Amen. 
I'm often amazed at, at our scientists because uh, they're afraid of what might possibly happen in our future. What happens if a meteor hits our world? Can I remind you that God is the creator and there's not one piece of rock in the universe that gets out of orbit according to God being the upholder of all things. Let's remind ourselves nothing like that happens without God knowing about it. I mean, if God knows when a dove falls out of the sky, you think God know, would know when a planet or some rock in the, in the universe would fly out of its course of orbit? Amen. God knows exactly how things are going. God is the creator of all things. Also, he is God, not just because he is creator, but because he is the Son of God. Notice there that he spoke unto us, verse 2, by his Son. Again, I wanted to try to embrace this whole thought here. You know, we didn't live on the time of Christ a couple thousand years ago. You know, we weren't uh, walking the roads of Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria when our Savior was walking those roads. But the reality is God said now he is still speaking to us according to his Son. Now capture this. He spake unto us by his Son in these last days. I would say this. Jesus Christ is still speaking to us in these last days. It's found in the Word of God. Amen. You agree with that or not? Oh, he's God. The Word of God is still speaking to us. God is still talking to us by his own Son, in which he not only created the world, but he also says in verse 3 that he is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Can I tell you this morning, I would have loved to have laid my eyes on the life of Christ. No doubt about it. I hope I would have been a follower and not one of those that turned their back on the Lord. But I know this, God gives me the privilege of laying my eyes on him every day. God gives me the privilege of laying my eyes on him all the time through the word of his power. Amen. You see, the book you have in your lap is not just some other book. We know that. It indeed is the Word of God. And God declares that if Christ is the Word and the Word is God and Christ is the express image of His person, then the book you have in your lap is alive and well. And God said, I am the upholder because I am God. I am He who not only spoke things into existence, but I am also He that is God. The Lord Jesus Christ declared in Matthew 28, 18, he said, all power is given unto me both in heaven and in earth. By the way, the Lord said that while he was still walking the dirty roads there in the Jerusalem area. The Lord said that and I, all power is given unto me. The Lord said I could, I could cause the rocks to cry out unto me. I could have the, the legions of angels come and deliver me from this death. He told his disciples in the end is the upholder and all power is given unto him because he's God. God is a God that loves to share with us. And the idea of upholding or carrying all things certainly includes the idea that because he is God, he has the privilege. Can I remind ourselves then one quick thought? If God is the one upholding all things because he's the creator, because he's God, there's one simple conclusion. <laughs> you and I are not carrying it. You and I are not the ones in charge, amen. We are not the ones that can control things. We are not the ones. We have trouble enough navigating and steering our own lives, our own personal lives, much less the orbit of the planets in the universe, amen. We have enough time controlling our own heart to steer our heart towards the God. And God said, because I am God and because I am creator, I am upholder of all things. Point number two. He upholds, and I want to put the emphasis here, he upholds all things. All things. Do you understand that God is the sustainer again of the sun in the universe? Again, you take, you take the sun into account. Uh, we would all be dead in a matter of seconds if we went much closer to the sun. Most of us burn now. Any amount closer we would burn up completely. God is a sustainer of the stars and the heavens. God, we talked about Pluto. God, do you understand though that God is also the upholder of the raging seas on the planet? You, you, you realize that the time of, of uh, uh, Noah there in Genesis chapter 6, where the Bible says that God broke up the waters of the deep. You understand that God has in his power to tell the waters of the deep now. Now's the time. Unleash your fury. 
God has the ability and the sustaining, carrying power to do such. God, God controls the seas. I often read the stories. I like Discovery Channel. I like different stories. I like true stories, even if they're, in a sense, catastrophic. You read about things like the Titanic. You read about other maritime disasters. You read about the storms and you read about the hurricanes. You read about the tornadoes. I, I, I watched the story just the other day on the tornado, the F5 tornado that went through Moore, Oklahoma just last year. I drove through that down the I-35 just a few days after that tornado went through the area, crossed over I-35. It looked like the backside of the moon. It was absolutely terrible. You've seen images of tornadoes before. It was an F5, the biggest one there could be. Everything was gone. There were kids in a school. It went directly over the top of a school, demolished a school, actually two different schools. In one school, there was only one child that died. In the other school, there were about 10. Some would say, does God upholding things or not? Is God really in control? Please understand, God's in control of the weather. God's in control of the sun. He's in control of the universe. God's in control of the raging seas. Can I say this way as well? God is in control. He's in control of disease. Is that right or not? I don't know what the stats are today. I think it's like one in three get cancer nowadays. One in three. I've already concluded that two of my family members are going to die of cancer. I got six, seven in my family now. A couple of us are going to wind up with cancer. Can I be honest with you? I'd rather be me than my kids. That'd be my choice. I've already lived a good portion of my life. I'd just seen them live theirs without dealing with cancer. By the way, most of us have dealt with cancer. Do you understand God understands disease and God upholds all things? God upholds all things. You see, when it comes to God being the great physician, let me touch base on this. It's important for us. When we look at disease, the idea of disease, and whether or not God is in control of things, we have to remind ourselves that God is in control even though his control may not be to our personal best benefit. So I want God to remove this cancer. I want God to spare my family from more tornado. I don't want the hurricane to ruin my family or my home. In the end, God is in control of all things. And in the end, you and I must submit ourselves that God knows what he's doing all the time. Is that right or not? It's important for us to remember. Because in our personal experiences, we begin to wonder, well, does God still love me? I mean, I thought God was in control of everything. Why did that happen? In the end, God is in control of all things. He's in control. He's in control of animals. He's in control of the mountains. We read just last week on the anniversary of Mount St. Helens, how that mountain exploded. God's in control of that. God knows about those things. God is in control of men. And might I ask and remind you of this, God is in control of you and I. God should be, as Christians, God should be the absolute preeminent controller of our life. God sustains and upholds all things. That must include his children as well. Dare us not allow God to have the control of our life. Amen. The concept of God being in charge, the God the concept of God carrying all things. I want to remind you of one more thing here. As he upholds all things, God allows all things to be carried out according to his will. All things are moving towards God's plan and God's desire. You and I must come to terms with the fact that God indeed is in control. Might I add one more thing here that God is in control of? God is in also in control of angels. He's also in control of demons. God understands it all. He is in control and upholder of all things things. Let me give you a third point quickly, and that is this. Notice verse 3. He is upholding all things by the word of his power. The word word here is an interesting word. In the Greek language, it's the word rhema. Rhema is to be noted in the Greek language, is to be noted from the word logos. Logos is the most common use of God's language for something said. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. This word is the word rhema, and this one is, is something spoken. 
This is more along the lines of the Holy Spirit of God as he speaks to us the words of God. God would speak truth, and this word rhema is how God communicates or speaks his truth into life. Now, in this context, he says, God upholds all things by the spoken word, by the rhema of his power. In other words, when God says rock, you move from there to there, the rock moves. If God said, this planet, you come out of your orbit and you sling yourself into the deep parts of space, the planet would do it. We have a great concept of that and with creation itself. And God said, let there be light. It's the spoken word, if you will, and, and certainly the word of God's power speaks and things happen. It's amazing when God begins to talk how well things really begin to happen. Therefore, he upholds all things. By the word of his power, the word power is the most common word we see in the word, uh, in the scriptures, it's the word dunamis. We get our word dynamite. I want you to put it again, put it in in, uh, the context here. God says, let me say something. And this power that God exudes, this dynamite power of God's word. God says to you, I want you to turn here. God says to you, I need you to believe this. God says to you, I have determined it to be this way. And our heart should respond to the powerful spoken word of the Lord. God reminds you, I'm upholding all things. And it's my word that matters. It's not your determination. It's not your spoken word. It's not your negotiation. It's not your wisdom. It's the wisdom and words of God in heaven that determines how things are upheld. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. It's often where we look to God and wonder what he's doing when things don't go our way. But then when things, the possibility of what could be, when we have the faith to look into the future and say, now now it could be this way, we want God's power to be evident. But when God's power, again, doesn't necessarily go the way we think, sometimes we begin to question God's power according to his plan. Verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 says it this way. I love these verses. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. God showed his power the very power that God tells the planets to stay in their place. It's the very power that Jesus Christ exuded walking on the water in the midst of the raging storm. He said, peace, be still. It's the same power that Jesus Christ exuded when standing in front of Lazarus' tomb in John 11 says, hey, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus stood up off his deathbed and came walking out of his tomb. It's the same power when the, man, when the Lord Jesus Christ looked into the eyes of the adulterous woman in John chapter 8 after rebuking the Pharisees you which hath no sin cast the first stone and then he looks the woman right in the eyes and he says to her go and sin no more God's power is powerful God's word I imagine that woman feeling the exuberation of keeping her life yet she hears the powerful words of Christ go and sin no more sin no more Your adultery is an abomination before God. God having spared her life, his word now is a powerful spoken word. It's the same word of God as he cast the planets into the world, into the universe. It's the same power of which God, Romans chapter 6 talks about. It's the same power that God reached into the tomb of our Savior and brought him to life again which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. It's the same power that God demonstrates in your life and mine. Can I remind you it's the same power that God uses to carry your life. Can I ask you a question? Where are you going? Where is your life headed? Will you let the Lord carry you along? Will you let the Lord uphold you? Let him uphold you because he's creator and he's God. Let him uphold you because all power has been given unto him by God in heaven. 
Let him uphold you because all things are in his control. And please understand, if God is concerned about the sun in the universe, and God knows when any dove or bird falls out of the sky, God is definitely concerned about where you're headed. And if God is concerned about you, in the end, will you listen to God's powerful word spoken that would give you direction and give you courage? Your life seems like it's tumbled over. Your life may seem like it's upside down. The reminder, the reminder is that God upholds all things by the word of his power. He's the great God in heaven that spoke into existence all the worlds. It's the same great God in heaven that speaks to your heart and draws you unto himself. One final thought here. I thought this was really interesting. Look at verse number three again. It says, And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins. Can I say to you that God certainly begins to uphold your eternal security in your life when he purges your sin from your life. We once again have an insertion of the gospel message into God's idea of upholding all things. God so desires to carry your life. But I'm going to tell you this morning, God will carry your life because you believed in Jesus Christ. Amen. God desires you to believe on the Lord. When he had purged our sins, it says, and finally notice this, the last phrase of verse 3, and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I want you to capture this. The, the Lord is so powerful. The Lord Jesus Christ, the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, who was there when he spoke into existence the world. Listen to this now. He upholds and carries all things while sitting down on the job. He is so powerful, he need not stand up. He is so wise in his plan, he need not fret. He is so caring. He need not rush to judgment or action. God sitting down at the right hand of majesty from his leisurely position, according to our statement, from his leisurely position tells the world what to do. He commands all things. He upholds all things. God's will is being carried out and God is in control. God is a great God who now from his throne, who now from his position of, thr of his throne would say to you, come unto me. Come unto me. You got the weight of the world bearing down on your back? Come unto me. You have the weight of sin bearing down on your heart and your mind? Is your mind so burdened with the things you cannot change and the weight of the world which you cannot relieve? God said, you come unto me. Are you so burdened about the issue of your eternity, where you will spend eternity? You're losing sleep over the issue of whether or not you're saved. God said, come unto me, and I will give you rest. God says to us to come, come in before his throne. Hebrews chapter 4 would say it this way, we come unto the throne of God to find grace and mercy and obtain help in the time of need. Come unto the throne of the Lord. So I wonder this morning, how much does the world wait to you? Whatever the world wastes to you, it wastes nothing to God. He is creator. He has created all things, and he is upholding and carrying all things. And in the end, he does it by the power of his word. So the Lord says to you this morning, come. Would you come unto me? Come and seek my face, the Lord would say. Come before my throne and find the mercy and help. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for your word. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for the truth that you're upholding all things. Father, where would our world be without you? Where would our world be if it weren't for you carrying us along? And Father, regardless of all the circumstances of life, Lord, in the end, help us to remember that you carry all things because you are God, because you're powerful, because of your word. And Father, you're certainly concerned about us. I wonder, Lord, if we would consider our heart today. Lord, look deep into our heart. Help us to respond to you now, Father, in faith. Father, we certainly ask and pray these things in Jesus' name.